Welcome to Galveston Unscripted. Hello and welcome to Galveston Unscripted. This episode is a very special one. When I think of history, especially on Galveston Island, I tend to think of the actions, economics, and stories of the humans that have lived here on Galveston Island. On this episode, we're going to take a look at the past few centuries through a different lens. We're going to explore how the DNA of one of the world's most critically endangered species still runs wild on the island today. Galveston Island holds one of the last pieces to the puzzle to bring this species back from near extinction. Have you ever been roaming around the island and seen a coyote? Have you ever wondered to yourself, wow, that coyote looks a little different than other coyotes I've seen in other places? Galveston is home to the rare coyote red wolf hybrid. Hundreds of years ago, before European settlement, the Red Wolves' territory spanned the entire southeastern United States. This included Texas and Galveston Island. Throughout the 19th and 20th century, the Red Wolf was driven into near extinction. In the 1980s, the last known Red Wolves were captured in western Louisiana and southeastern Texas. They were transferred to North Carolina to a wildlife refuge to begin species restoration efforts. This restoration project is still taking place today. After the devastating Hurricane Ike in 2008, a Galveston biologist had a run-in with some coyotes. He noticed something different about these coyotes. These were not your everyday coyote. He began photographing these animals, which led him down a path he did not expect. Ron Wooten's photographs opened the door to key research that could save the red wolf species from extinction. In this episode, biologist Ron Wooten and I discuss his story on how he discovered the coyote red wolf hybrids on Galveston Island, the part he plays in key research and the part every single Galvestonian and visitor can play, if and when they encounter a coyote red wolf hybrid. I believe it's important that we study all aspects of history, including ecological history, mainly because it affects us today. It's hard to imagine Galveston Island a thousand years ago, with red wolves and native peoples roaming all over the island. If you enjoyed this episode, please don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. And also, follow us on social media. It means the world to us. Galveston Unscripted is dedicated to educating and entertaining. If you haven't yet, check out the episode description. Click that link to the interactive map. We're utilizing this podcast and developing an audio tour of the entire island. And you can help by sharing this podcast and audio tour with locals and visitors alike. Welcome to Galveston, the world's largest free museum. And this is your audio guide, Galveston Unscripted. Without further ado, my conversation with Ron Wooten. Ron, I'd wanted to get you in here today to just ask you a few questions and hear your perspective and story on the Red Wolves. I know you've been featured all over the country. Have you been featured anywhere outside of the U.S.? When a few of those stories came up, well, yeah, actually, the Australian Broadcasting Company, we did a podcast with them, Dr. Kristen Brzezeski. She's the, one of the co-researchers with the genetics that I sent the materials to. She and I were on that program. That's pretty interesting. Uh, and after the New York Times article and then after the Texas Parks and Wildlife article, I was hearing from people all over the world that were friends. And I was like, holy crap, <laughs> that went big. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. And I'm sorry about my language there. But... Oh, no, you could say whatever you want. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. The story went much bigger and much faster than I ever thought it would. It was terrifying, but it was pretty exciting, too. We have some pretty cool animals here. <laughs> yeah. So can we start from the very beginning and start from how you even got involved in all this? I was getting ready to go to grad school. It was before then. I was also working offshore. But I was writing monthly articles for Galveston Monthly. My focus was primarily the natural part of Galveston. I was writing articles on the nature stuff and the ecosystems and conservation and issues. And one of the things that I wanted to write about was the Galveston coyotes. I kept on trying to find them. I kept on trying to get pictures. I kept, The way I wrote the articles, I would write the article, but I would also want my own photos to be in there because I was a selfish person. You so. are a great <laughs> photographer. So I, I appreciate that. That's kind of you. I looked around for these animals for a long time. Turns out, in between the time I was writing and the time that this event happened, we had this little thing called Ike. We let our dog out one night, and he was off a leash, went outside, and the pack took him. He went across the ditch, and he went to a. F they took him off to a field, and I went out in the field in the middle of the night with the flashlight and saw the pack, saw my dog there. He was deceased already, and they were doing the business on him, eating him. And I uh, chased him off, 
found a bag, put the rest of my dog in it, and turned the flashlight back around on him. And I looked at him, and there was, uh, they, it was just pretty interesting. The whole pack was looking at me. They were snarling, was yelling at him, telling him to leave my dog alone. And at the time, they didn't have any food. The island after Ike was dead quiet. There was no no birds. I guess all the rabbits are probably drowned. All the rats are probably drowned, except for the ones that got up high. So food was pretty rare and pretty scarce for the predators. We'd seen them out in the garbage. At that point, they were digging through people's garbage. And I thought, I really need to write an article because there's, I'm either going to be really upset these animals for eating my dog, or I'm going to be, I'm going to try to find out about them and see what's going on. So for three or four years, I, I kept on looking for a pack, kept on trying to find a pack. Didn't really have a whole lot of time because we were in school and turns out a friend of mine here, Donita McMahon, Donita called me and she said, hey, there's a big pack back here. She was over, I'm not going to say exactly where because I don't necessarily like to share the locations because not everybody likes these animals. Anyway, she called and said there was a big pack. Patricia and, and my wife and my niece and my daughter, Emily, we all went over to this apartment and we got up there and we saw them and there was a pack of about 10 to 12 animals that night. And it was really exciting. It was a little bit dark. I got some pictures that night. But they weren't that great and I was hoping we'd get some better pictures. She called a couple nights later I said, hey, they're back. So we rode over there, and it was lighter. 12 to 14 animals over there. They were everything from less than a year old to the alpha male and female, and then several that were within a year or two years. I'm not sure exactly about their biologic makeup of their packs, but you could tell that it was a big family pack. Mom and dad, the alphas were there, and the kids were all playing. And right when we got there, a siren had gone through on the seawall, and they had all been howling. And I thought, man, I got. I was working so hard to get my camera out, and I got the. I finally got it up and on. And the only one I got was the one on the far right. She was the only one still howling. Everybody else was. Uh, everybody else had stopped. And they were just looking. <laughs> it would have been a cool picture because the whole mess was howling, even the pups took the pictures and I put them on my computer and was looking at them. And as I was looking at them, I was thinking, New York Times put it, and I, I, it's embarrassing because it was a funny thing to say, but I thought that Marmaduke had made it with these or a great big day, a great Dane or some other big dog had made it with a coyote because they were very long-legged. They were very big-headed. They had long big ears and their eyes were just not quite right they for coyotes they have a sharp nose and they have the eyes that are pretty close together but these were a little bit spread apart i thought man these and these are so different i started thinking about it and i uh, was thinking about the genetic class that i took in college back in the 90s and i'm not much of a geneticist and i don't remember much of genetics but i remembered some of the things about island genetics and how an isolated group of animals could maintain their genetic purity. And I started thinking, they got all the red wolves from this area back in the day when they were catching them to take them to the Carolinas. And I thought that, uh, hey, maybe these are just some red wolves. So I started looking. You had known that the red wolves were declared extinct, was it 40 years ago? Extinct in the wild in the, uh, I think in the late 80s. Okay. A got some of the last red wolves, maybe hybrids or red wolves, from this area, from the western Louisiana, eastern Texas, all along the coast, and then took them to North Carolina. Yes. Is that was. correct? Okay. They took them to Carolina, but they also captured these animals. And as they, they got more, they took them to breeding facilities. And I can't tell you the number of breeding facilities that there are, but there was one in the St. George Island in Florida, the, I think some of the zoos here in Texas have them. There's a zoo in Washington that has. There's several places where they're bre they're breeding and trying to get these animals to stay mm -hmm. alive, yeah. <laughs> to yeah. not be extinct. Did all of this spur from a few of your photos, or was it from the photos, or was it from the genetic sample that you sent off originally? What I was thinking when after looking at those animals in the pictures. I thought that the only way that they were ever going to be able to find out if these animals were red wolves is if we had some tissue. And I wasn't going to go out and kill one. 
<laughs> but at the same time, I remember seeing them throughout the years we've been here. We've been here for 34 years now. Occasionally, you see them dead on 3005. And I was thinking that might happen. And sure enough, found a male and a female pretty close to the area where we saw the big pack. I took a couple of tissue samples, put them in my freezer. and How did Trish take that when you came home with that? Fortunately, they were small tissue samples. Okay, okay. You, don't you didn't bring the whole a, coyote no. with you? Uh, trust me, she is so patient and loving and kind, and she tolerates me. Got a rattlesnake in there. At the time, I had deer hides in there. I had a flying fish from offshore. I had some painted bunning that had hit our window and died. As a biologist, I had a lot of dead stuff in the freezer. Put it in bag, be mm. hidden. But yep. uh, she was very tolerant, and I'm very grateful. <laughs> yeah. So this is well, way more than a hobby for you. I guess we can get a little bit in your background here. This is something you wanted to do: is study biology. When I went to Texas A&M in the College Station, and I was in the Wildlife and Fisheries program, my degree was in general degree in that study, Wildlife and Fisheries. You bet. I wanted to be a biologist. I wanted to go out and study uh, study this world and know more about it. I wanted to know names. I wanted to see things. I, throughout all my time, collecting things is just second nature. I think if you go to any biologist house, you'll find all kinds of stuff that maybe shouldn't be there. Yeah. You mentioned islands and genetic species on islands. Are there any other species or any other animal here in Galveston that is similar to the coyote red wolf hybrid in that it's a genetic species on its own? Not that I'm aware of. No, we have some birds that are here on the island, the snowy plover and the red knot, two endangered birds that are on the island. But And of course, we have all the sea turtles that use the island to either nest or I guess only the Ridley and the loggerhead nest here. But every once in a while, you find the others. And then, of course, you we get the, the occasional whale wash up. But Which is always super interesting. To get it's the always whale. interesting. <laughs> It is always interesting. We had that one wash up in December of 2015 that was a say whale. It was very sad, but interesting. Were you involved with that at all? Taking pictures. Oh, taking pictures, of course. <laughs> yeah. Of course. Are you involved in any of the continual research? I know there are a lot of other people involved in the coyote red wolf hybrid research. Are you still actively involved or is it on the peripherals now? At this point, I'm somewhat involved. When they first started, we, we hosted one of the researchers, a genetic researcher named Tanner Barnes. He came down and stayed with us there in Jamaica Beach and he was doing scat analysis across the island. And it was really interesting. He knows more about those animals now than, than I ever did and more than most anybody ever will, I'm pretty sure. It was really awesome working with him. Showed him where a few of them were, took him out there, and sure enough, we found them. And then he took it off from there, and he uh, he was able to identify all kinds of animals on this island. He came down three times. The second time, we couldn't keep him because of COVID issues. It was an honor being part of his research. Now he's got his master's, and he's looking for a job. Well, if you you're can, out you there. You can scratch that. Tanner you, is a great biologist. and If you're out there and you're looking for a biologist... Reach out. I'll yeah. put a link in the description. Yeah, Tanner Barnes, he was really nice to work with. And then Dr. Kristen Berzeski came down. They came down in August 2019. She came down with Tanner and came down with a guy named Tristan Spensky. He was the photographer that for the New York Times article. And we took them around to, or I took them around to several places and we found some animals. And it was really exciting. As far as for now and research, if I find a dead animal, I'll take a tissue sample and send it off to him. Or if I if I can help in any way, I'll send Josh Henderson with the Galveston Animal Control. Josh is now doing the research with the collars and tracking the animals on the island, which is really interesting and cool. We have some a doctor from St. Mary's. She's also she's put up camera traps throughout the island to try to find them and get imagery and understand their interactions. So there's all kinds of research going on. There's the Gulf Coast Canid Project, which is something that's stemmed out of this. At the same time as the paper was published with the Galveston animals, they had collected some tissues in Louisiana, and they found some animals there that were actually a little bit more wolfy than, oh, wow. uh, than the Galveston animals. So the thinking is, and it's a, it's absolutely my thinking too, is that there's still got to be some red wolves out there somewhere. And if not, then they're pretty close to 
full red wolf, even if the coyotes had come in and taken over the territories. Just because the red wolf behavior, they don't necessarily like to interact with the coyotes, unless that's the only thing that's left available. (laughs) So the red wolf, a few hundred years ago, whenever you had explorers just showing up here in this part of the country, my understanding is that there were tons and tons of red wolves. But of course, their landscape changed. A lot of things changed. Could you elaborate on why the red wolves phased out coyotes and other wolves took over? My understanding is that you see this with all the big predators, is that when particularly European uh, descent people move into areas, they have a tendency to go out and kill the big predators. And the red wolf was the big predator here, along with the bears. We had bears not on the island here, but there were bears in Texas. There were lots more mountain lions, other large cats, and for the damages that they did to livestock, for the fear. There's a lot of unnecessary fear about big predators. There was a concerted effort to kill these animals, both here on the island and on the uh, the mainland. People settled and put their animals out there to graze and feed. With coyotes. Coyotes are just unbelievably prolific. So does it just make sense that the red wolf DNA would survive with the coyotes since they are literally everywhere? I've seen photos of them in Manhattan, which is insane. Yeah, they that as I was doing the research to try to figure out if I needed to contact them, I started reading a little bit about the koi wolves. You were exactly right about those Manhattan wolves, coyote wolf hybrids. I thought that was an interesting story. I've never seen a pure red wolf pack. I've never seen pure coyote pack now here on the island, I guess. I would think that the red wolf size and aggression towards the coyotes would keep them away a little bit, but I don't know that. It doesn't surprise me that their genetics is still around, though. No, not at all. I think that they took advantage of being able to breed with coyotes, and so we have a big, messy hybridization that's been ongoing for at least four decades now, maybe probably longer. I know there's a significant size difference between a normal coyote and a red wolf hybrid. It's fairly significant. I think the red wolves range from 40 to 60 pounds and are taller and longer. The coyotes tend to be a lot smaller. The coyotes, it seems, are more able to live within the human settlements. When I was looking them up, I thought that maybe the red wolves were keeping the prime real estate on the island and chasing off the coyotes, but the uh, scat analysis that Tanner did shows that's not true at all. So it's very interesting. But yeah, there's the red wolves t- do tend to be a larger animal, and they look different. And coloration, the, the phenotype, is always going to be variable according to anything. You can have a dark wolf, you could have a white wolf, and the same thing with coyotes and So coloration isn't necessarily a good factor in identifying them, but these animals that I saw that day, they they were super red and they were super big, and I was thinking this is not exactly a coyote. Why is it important to keep these animals? I've been, there's a lot of people on Facebook and the neighborhood, and there's a lot of people talking about wanting to kill them, wanting to sterilize them, wanting to harm them, or just take them off the island completely and move them someplace else. They do a great job managing rodents. I've got some great pictures of some that were in a field, and they were pouncing and jumping on rats left and right, rats and mice. At the golf course, if you go out to the Moody Gardens golf course, you'll see all kinds of rabbits. You'll see all kinds of other different rodents out there. So naturally, you have some animals living close over there. The genetics... These animals have ghost alleles, and the ghost alleles are things that are no longer present in the current extant population of red wolves. So with the advances in technology, with the CRISPR technology, perhaps there's a way that those genetics can be taken and extracted, put into the current population, and make them more genetically variable. Right now, it's familial inbreeding. If you don't have enough variation, then you end up with the genetics just goes downhill. And hopefully they can find out a way to take the genetics in these animals and combine it. So keeping these animals alive is paramount to that.
the research that is being done and could be done for exactly what you just mentioned, ghost alleles and using CRISPR technology, not only could that research assist the red wolves, red wolf hybrids, but it could assist other endangered species or extinct species as well. Is that correct? That's my thinking. I think that's what, that's what the geneticists are thinking. They're not quite there yet. Dr. Brzezewski did a great interview, she and Dr. Von Holt. Dr. Von Holt was a person. That, I'm going to back up a little yeah, bit go ahead. tell you the story. So it took me it took me five years to find somebody that would listen. Okay, I talked to Texas Parks and Wildlife. I talked to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I even called up the Red Wolf program up in the Carolinas and asked the person. I said, "Look, I found these animals here. They look really strange. They look really wolfy. I think they probably are more red wolf than coyote." Can't, what can we do? Some people said oh, they're extinct. They just took well, took the narrative and ran with it. Others said, yeah, they're pretty interesting. We're not going to do anything with it. And then I finally found a guy, and his name was Dr. Dave Meech, M-E-C-H. He was my last straw. If, if he hadn't responded, I would have just probably folded and let it go. But uh, I was watching a wolf program on YouTube in which he was featured. He was willing to ask questions about his own, some of his own findings and question his, some of the results. I did a little search and creeped around on the internet and found his, uh, his email. And I sent him a picture, a picture of the big group. And I said, Dr. Mish, I don't know what to do with this. I think these are probably very special animals. Are you willing to help or what can we do? Within a few minutes, he responded and said, where are these? And he was really excited. You could see it in the note. By the end of the afternoon, he had set me up with an email group with Dr. Von Holt from Princeton Canine Ancestry Research, Joey Hinton, Dr. Joey Hinton, who's currently doing some of the tracking and wolf research in Louisiana, Ron Nowak, who was a U.S. Fish and Wildlife biologist who was working with the red wolves over there, Neil Hutt, who is a champion of red wolves through a red wolf conservation group. I sent that group the same picture, and I said, what are we going to do? What, what What's up? Is, are these different? Dr. Von Holt responded and said, those are really interesting. Do you have any tissue? And I said, well, by the way, I do have some. My wife has tolerated my tissues in the freezer. And it's, unfortunately... It's next to the popsicles. <laughs> right next to popsicles, yeah. <laughs> little, little, Don't worry about the hair. <laughs> I was just totally excited. I was thrilled that she was willing to look at them. And I thought, man, this is, what if we have red wolves here? So I went digging through the freezer and I was only able to find one sample. And I was just devastated because I had the two and they needed more tissue samples. So I remembered the last one that I had taken a tissue sample. I had the scalpel in my truck and I kept it in my truck. Biology thing, if you see something, you're going to do something with it. So I sent the first tissue sample from one that had been there for a couple of years and I sent in the scalpel that I had taken the other with and they were able to extract the DNA from the scalpel for the second tissue sample. That was where the December 2019 article or the paper came from that started this whole thing. Actually, I remember reading a little bit about that. People didn't believe you, or at least you had to find the right route. Yeah, the biologists, for the most part, told me that they were already extinct, and there's no way they'd be down here. After I did some research and read about how they captured them, and they used sirens, and they were listening for the wolfy-sounding animals out in the fields, and then they'd put out their traps and capture those, and if they didn't look wolf enough, then because at that point they didn't have genetic testing. So if they did, weren't big enough or didn't look wolf enough, then they, I don't know if they killed them or if they let them go, but they didn't take them. So you were like, look at these photos. Come on now, look at them. These have got to be red wolves. I'm looking yeah. at them. The interesting thing too, my daughter, Emily, she made a nifty little comparison. She took one of the animals in the big photo that was facing me and she put that animal's neck picture next to a coyote and then she sent another picture that had that animal's picture next to a wolf. When you look at those two things, there's no no doubts. It was like, man, those are pretty wolfy looking animals. So that was pretty much a, another driver. Thank you, Emily. <laughs> that that was a driver, and so it was just like I say, it was. Uh, it took a good five years for somebody to listen, and when they finally did, then I was most thankful the fact that it turned out to be such a thing. So what's next in the research? 
I think that they're going to be doing some more research on the pack locations and the pack interactions. I think one of the, the key things that they're going to have to do here on the island before it gets too late in the game is they're going to have to determine which of these habitats on the island are valuable. First, they're going to have to determine if these animals are worth saving. And if they are worth saving, then they're going to have to determine which of the habitats are the most valuable for them. And they're going to have to try to purchase the land and keep it from being developed. Before Ike, there was a, seemed like a pretty big amount of development throughout the island after Ike. It just screeched to a stop. And now, as people have forgotten Ike, and as people are, well, as property prices are going crazy, the property is becoming very marketable, and people are selling their big properties, and other people are developing those properties. We see that out in the West End quite a bit these days. And it's pretty disappointing. We're always going to have the state park. There's animals that are near the airport. Unless they go crazy on the airport, they're going to let them live there. There's other properties. Artist Boat has done a great job of preserving habitat here on the island. My dream job, if I could, I would like to set up an interpretive center at some point on the West End. Maybe have an observation booth someplace that was near a pack or in an area where a pack typically would hunt or move through and be able to take people out and show them these animals, teach them about these animals. I would like to have a an educational program where we go into the schools and teach the kids about wolves versus coyotes, teach them the value of these animals because so much what they hear and see on television is about you know, terror and fear really no sense for that there it's very hard to find stories where people are have been hurt by these animals especially here on the island it just doesn't happen no they're animals you bet i've lost my dog scruffy we lost a cat marley we lost a couple of chickens the dog and the cat that's my fault i didn't have them on leash the cat was an outside cat he liked to go out and creep around and that was my fault because i didn't have him contained that's a problem we have on this island people need to take responsibility for the animals if they want the feral cats then go pick them up and take them home put them in your house otherwise i won't go much further on that i got gotcha. you uh, i understand where do we go to start your educational facility on the west end what would you like to see after the initial paper came out there was some discussion steve parker is a lawyer up in houston well, he was another one in that initial group and he is an avid red wolf enthusiast. He grew up in the Houston coastal area. The stories he has of red wolves throughout his lifetime and through his family's lifetime are amazing. And he is always making contact with people and talking to people. The pictures he sent me has been amazing. There was some talk with him and a professor at the University of Houston about setting up a nonprofit. Problem is, if these animals can't be protected, then... Maybe we could do public education. Maybe we could do podcasts <laughs> yeah, and talk well, about them. That's perfect. <laughs> yeah. There, there's just got to be a way to first preserve habitat and second, show the value of these animals to people so that they're not going to go outside and take their guns and shoot them or and they, uh, try to hit them when they're driving in the on 3005 or wherever else they're driving or be terrified of them when they're walking down the street here in the island and i know that happens all the time lots of reports of it and lots of lots of photos lots of emails lots of messages i get and i, I hate that people are so afraid of them having gone out there with scruffy and having a whole pack around me i wasn't scared they were just snarling at me but i yelled at them and they ran off and that was with food in their mouths and after not having food how many would you estimate are on Galveston Island? I don't know the correct mm -hmm. answer to that. It's got to be really hard to tell because for the East End, the people, they're living under abandoned homes. They're living in the, these empty lots sometimes, and you could walk by there a hundred times and never know they're there. Yeah, that was the beauty of Tanner's of Tanner's research because he did he did linear surveys throughout the island, and he was looking for scat throughout the island in these surveys. And I think he came up with a number between 60 and 80 animals on the island. I may be wrong about that. And when it came to the location of red wolf DNA, I thought it would be in the less populated areas, but it turns out it's all over the island, which is really cool. So it's pretty evenly distributed from east to west. 
that's my basic understanding of the of his research. What are the chances that there's just a 100% coyote running around on the island? Do you think that's pretty rare? 100% coyote? Uh-huh. Maybe. 100% red wolf? I don't think so, just because of the fact that he wasn't able to find any of the DNA, but that doesn't mean there's not that red wolf pair that's out in a in an isolated area on the island. I don't know. Now, do I... Other parts of the coast, they're finding more red wolf DNA. They found more red wolf DNA in the Louisiana specimens. And we've had lots of reports from both biologists with different agencies and sightings by individuals about very large animals being located in the Golden Triangle area. So the Golden Triangle area seems to be the place that I would say probably has a full red wolf somewhere. If there was another full red wolf discovered and captured humanely, of course. Could that be used to assist in North Carolina and everywhere else? Yep, absolutely. It'd be genetics in the mix right now, and that would be a blessing for those animals to have, have some fresh DNA. This entire journey, and it's been about, what, 10 years now? Yeah. Do you have any uh, favorite stories of going out and hunting and photographing? or From this effort, it took me several years to find finally get a picture but when Dr. Bozeski and Tanner and Tristan Spensky came down, very <laughs> they got down in the afternoon one day, and I was driving by the on the west end, and I saw two of them. It was just amazing. The next day, we went to Jamaica Beach, and we were looking in the state park. We saw them. The next day, we went to the east end. We saw them. So... Three, three consecutive days with those guys trying to help them find them. I felt <laughs> amazingly blessed. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. It was really cool. But had they not found them, it would have. It makes the story so much better when you can actually see the animals. When they were looking at them, they said, yeah, they're different. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Especially the ones on the West End, just completely different than a typical coyote. If I had my way, I would form a big team here in Galveston, and I would set up out on the West End an interpretive center for these animals and for the island itself. We'd teach people more about this and teach them with kindness and with love and respect, hopefully be able to make a difference in people's mentalities and their thinking about different things because it seems like there's just, we just need to be more loving to each other and more loving to this place that we're living in here. That's my hope to have an interpretive job, but if not, then I'll just have to work until I die. We'll see what we can do about getting <laughs> that started. We've covered so much. You've been so informative on this topic and about your story. Is there anything else that maybe we didn't cover at all that you would like to tell anybody about? I'll tell you one thing. There's a Facebook group called the Galveston Canyon Research Group. And one of our rules in that group is to not share locations because one of my biggest fears was and sharing locations that people would move into these areas and try to take pictures or try to see them ended up causing damages to the animals, either from them running away and running into traffic, chase them off of their habitats. If it just got too busy in there with the, with people, that was a big concern of mine. And I'll, I'll follow that up with the story that uh, of myself. And this was a, a regret that I have. One day there was a one of these canids that went out on one of the groins here in Galveston. Groin is just one of those the small jetties, uh, the little sand blockers. It had gone out there because somebody had seen it on the beach. It was trying to get away from the person, and it went out on the end of it. And I thought, well, this is interesting. It'd be a good picture. I went down there and I got to the just to the water's edge of that groin, and I was taking some pictures. And then a truck came on the beach. Animal control came down the other way. This animal saw that it couldn't get away. And it was a fairly rough day out there in the Gulf. And it ended up jumping. It jumped into the water. And I thought, well, it's okay. It's going gonna, it's gonna to come back. And it didn't. It ended up swimming out towards the end of the pleasure pier. Next day, they found it dead on the beach. This was one of my concerns when I shared the information, when the story came out, that there would be so much human interaction on these animals that would end up causing problems for them. Even in my own actions that day, I feel somewhat responsible for that animal having jumped. When I saw it was looking a little bit hesitant, I got away, but it was a little bit too late. The animal was already freaked out. 
So it, it did its jump in the water and that was it. So that's been that's been one of my concerns is that all the interest in these animals and sometimes when people are interested in things they have a tendency to follow them right up to the point where it's not good for the animal or the other person or whatever I did it myself and that's one of my little takeaways was that I just need to if you see them I like to leave them alone I I don't tell people where they are anymore, except for the researchers. And the researchers, it's because I feel like they're trying to do something good for them. But uh, for the most part, I feel like these things survived for years without us uh, messing with them. And I think that sometimes that's the best way, just to let something exist. Ron, where can people go to support anything you've discussed today to support these Red Wolf hybrids? There's three different places. First is the Red Wolf Coalition. That's based in North Carolina, and they are constantly trying to make sure that red wolves are cared for, both legally and through habitat. The other is Gulf Coast Canine Project. That's a great place, and they are really doing a lot of work to help with the research and the tagging and the tracking and Dr. Joey Hinton's running the tagging project there, and Josh Henderson with the animal control is running it here. And then if you want to try to help preserve habitat, Carla Clay with Artist Boat is in the middle of trying to preserve acreage here on the island that is essential. They have some of these canids close to their property. If we can help with uh, preserving habitat on the island, that would be very beneficial for these animals. Those are my three suggestions if people want to help with this project, help with these animals. Hopefully we can use this platform to educate and inform, not to bother these animals, and they are very important to not only Galveston, but to this entire species. To the whole world. Yeah, to the whole world, yeah. This is the most endangered canid on the planet. There's only 20, if there's even that many, only 20 in the wild, and uh, I think 120 or so in breeding programs. They're on their last leg. And hopefully these animals along the Gulf Coast can help them get back up. But uh, who knows? I hope so. Ron, thank you so much for your research, your discovery, your persistence, and getting these photos out. I know it, it's, it means a lot. It really does. I'm honored to have, to have time to, to speak with you, JR. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. Honored. Thank you for listening to Galveston Unscripted, your audio guide to the world's largest free museum, Galveston Island. If you enjoyed this episode, please don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe to Galveston Unscripted. And please follow us on social media. We are literally everywhere. Just check out the description below. Thank you so, so much, and we'll see you next time on Galveston Unscripted. For historic resources or more information, check out the episode description.